And we're back. This is Columbia Calling, episode 511. My very special guest this week is on the line from Medellin. I'm slightly disappointed she's not on the line from the Choco, but we're talking to Lindsay Rankin, who is what is it, Anglo-Australian, I like to say. She's a, well, now a long-term resident of the Pacific coast that's Colombia's pacific coast but she's in medellin and we're just going to talk about life in general challenges and so on and just a little bit of a background note there the humidity and the pacific coast is such that we had to change from her computer to her phone to record this so listen to the sound a bit because she's got damp in her phone and there's and in her computer and mushrooms are growing in it so welcome on the columbia calling <laughs> podcast lindsay what an introduction uh it's certainly <laughs> the humidity is formidable on the coast and uh i was just back there and uh you know out of habit just going through all my boxes of things and everything is full of mold it's incredible tenace but anyway there's so many you, other wonderful things that we can turn a blind eye and and uh you know it's part of the price of paradise as my friend says okay okay but one quick follow-up question can you keep a book uh, there or does it just mold up well, I'll have to let you know on that. Um, my passport <laughs> didn't fare too well after about a year there oh, during the God. pandemic. Um, and I remember handing it over to people with quite a lot of pen at actually, you know, in the migration office going, I'm really sorry, I live in Choco. And they were like, ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes. So we've, I could understand this. And that's what I, I mean. My I, I thing is, I, I haven't been to the Pacific Coast in many, many years. And I want to go back actually when my younger son is a bit older to be able to appreciate it. I absolutely love it. I've been up and down. One of the first places I ever visited in Colombia was in, in 1999, I believe. I think it wow. was. I worked for WWF and I traveled from Bahia Malaga all the way down through the mangroves to Buenaventura. Um, what a trip. It, it was quite the eye opener, uh, quite uh, obviously 99, different Colombia altogether. Uh, but you are a long time resident out there. How did that happen? <laughs> Great question. Well, I had already been living in Colombia um, for quite some time, for a couple of years, and um, living and working in Pereira in the coffee region. And a good friend of mine um, had some land out there. Basically, I'd been doing bits and bobs in tourism. I was managing some boutique properties in the coffee region. And he proposed that we go on this adventure together and look at his family's land and maybe um, look into the, the prospects of doing a project out there together, like a boutique property or an eco lodge. So that was the premise. And he had me sold on Avioneta and Lancia. I was like, great, sounds like my kind of trip. Um, so off we went and I just fell in love with the whole uh, process, like the journey, looking out this tiny little nine seater plane window uh, at this a mass of jungle and meandering rivers. And I just thought, good grief, where are we going? You know, no infrastructure. Um, and when we got there, it was again, you know, it was in about 2015 I went. So it was a very different uh, new key as well then. There's been lots of improvement. They actually have a paved airport now, an airstrip before it was a, a muddy runway. So there's been lots of changes in the time. But we spent about two weeks there and I just fell in love with it. I'd never been to a place so pure, so free of contamination and kind of human interference to find these uh, cultures so intact uh, in terms of their way of life and um, and uh, ancestral knowledge and all of that just really stayed with me. So I was actually working at that point as a teacher in a bilingual school. And I remember sitting there in my desk, just daydreaming about the Pacific. And so much so that when they asked me if I wanted to renew my contract, I told them, no, I'm gonna go to the Pacific. I had no plan, but I just felt it in my soul, in my bones that I needed to be there. And I had a certain purpose to fulfill that. So I kind of, um, launched myself into the fry pan, so to speak, because obviously it's associated with my job was my visa, my cushy apartment, like I had a nice little package. And so I didn't really think it through that much. Um, so I ended up going to Canada and uh, got a few jobs while I was there staying with a friend and saving some money. And it was then that I saw all of this information about retreats, yoga retreats in Mexico, Costa Rica. And I thought, you know, that place would be perfect for retreats. And so that's when the little the little seed was planted and um, 
I started developing a business plan around that. Um, I say business plan, I mean scribbles in my diary about what it would be like and the name and logo and things like that. I didn't really even do a budget, to be honest. Um, and so went back there with that plan. So I returned in end of 2017 with the idea that I was either going to buy a piece of land, build something, rent something. And that's when I discovered Moro Terco, which was going to be, which was for three years, the the home of Prana Pacifico. I, so tell us exactly where you are, because you're not, I mean, if we look at the map, uh, you know, you look out west to the Colombian Pacific Department of Choco, huge department, and the capital is kind of in the center called Quibdo. And then if you, I guess if you're flying west from there, almost directly west from there, it's Nuki, but you're not in Nuki. No, I'm a little south from Nuki. It's about a 40 minute boat ride um, along the coast. Mm. So it's wonderful. It has, it's funny, bless my, my mom. She always says, oh, how's the island? You know, cause it has a feeling of an island because you've got mm. forest on one side with no road access. And then you have Pacific ocean and this very long, wild strip of coastline which as you said mm -hmm. you know runs all the way all the way down to, to Buenaventura so um it's uh it's absolutely stunning um and the little there's so basically the seven corregimientos from from Nuki well starting just before Nuki which is um Jurubira, and then it goes Nuki um Pangi, Coqui, Jovi, Termales and so Termales mm -hmm. is the little fishing village where I chose to make my home. Um, there's about 270 people, predominantly of uh, Afro-Colombian descent. Um, there's no energy or, or light. There's just a, a community planter, a generator that's turned on from three till 10 every day. And uh, if anybody wants to continue a party or watch the rest of their movie or whatever, they have to use their own source of power, which is either a generator or if they have mm -hmm. solar. So it's a it's a very different lifestyle for sure. <laughs> now, thermal is obviously means uh, you know thermal, so it's the where the ther I think I've been there many years ago, and there is yeah. a thermal area to go and bathe, right? You know, about, there about, is, yeah. yeah. And is this where we well, obviously you can't harvest it, but you can find wild vanilla pods around Termales. Exactly. I see you've done your research, yeah, which you is well done. Yes, well yeah. done. Yeah, <laughs> I it was just really an investigation um, of that was. <laughs> yes. No, there was um, a biologist um, called Catalina, uh, who I think she went to the coast maybe 15 years ago or something like that. It's a long term project. And she um, discovered all of these native species of vanilla, basically. So now it's been developed into a community project where they're actually mm -hmm. cultivating this vanilla for export, uh, national and international. And obviously, it's, I think, the second most valuable spice in the world. So it obviously has a great deal of potential and um, the fact mm. that it does grow it actually grows from an orchid. I wasn't aware of that. I was part of the mm. orchid family. So it's a, it's a really cool project. And there's so many now um, emerging from the Pacific. And I think it's a real shift in perspective, especially on a national level, because this part of the Colombia has been ignored for so long. Mm. It's been feared for so long. And um, there's still so many Colombians don't even know of it. Like when I say, oh, I live in New Key, they're like, where? They, they act as if yeah. it's a different country, you know? Um, and then there's, of course, a lot of ignorance and, and um, yeah, misinterpretation or, or, or whatever, or maybe a little bit um, Antigua kind of uh, mm. feelings about the place in terms of safety and um, what can be found there. There's often people make the comments like, oh, but it's black sand, like, oh, you know, it's not the Caribbean with the crystal clear waters and the white sandy beaches. But for me, the palette of colors of the Pacific is like nowhere else, like the rich greens and the like beautiful kind of teal of the water and these, you know, and the contrast with the dark sand. For me, it's so unique and so special. Um, so it's really interesting that um, now, like I said, there's been a bit more um, value placed in like plant medicine, for example, and the viche, the ancestral production of viche, which is now being recognized and and uh, sought after. Um, uh, coconuts, like the traditional um, way of um, harvesting and cultivating rice, like there's a, actually kind of been, because of the value placed on these things now with a bit of a shift, maybe post pandemic, and also just people wanting more of a healthy kind of off-grid lifestyle perhaps, mm -hmm. there's a real shift towards that again. Um, and uh, 
it's really nice to see the people returning to cultivating the land and and feeling um validated i guess for their way of life you know yeah. i think I think when we think of the, the palette of colors of the Pacific, I always describe the Pacific when I used to do guidebooks and stuff as being just entirely natural, uh, where the jungle sort of tumbles into the ocean. And I don't, I don't have any issue with it being a dark sand. It all complements one another. Um, and it, you know, I want the Pacific coast to be different to the Caribbean coast. And you don't, you don't tell me that Cartagena itself doesn't have any white sandy beaches. You have to go elsewhere for those. So let's just stop. The Pacific coast is something very, very different. And I just think that's, you know, this, I have obviously, I've done my investigation uh, for another company about the um, vanilla. And I you obviously had a look into what's going in on with the Vice liquor. Yeah. I haven't tried it myself. I'm 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 trying oh, to steer clear of those sorts of things. <laughs> I'm coming to Bogota next week. We'll have to uh we'll have to meet up and oh, I'll uh, I'll introduce you to this magical, magical drink. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure it has magical effects and a magical morning after. But um, that that said, I just picked up there for you know you uh, you spent you spent uh, the pandemic in the Choco. I did. How I spent that? about half of it in Medellin, and the other half of it oh, okay. once I was able to get a um, humanitarian flight back, I I went. Mm. And um, but it was actually a really interesting time because. Um, you know, obviously a lot of my friends work in tourism, they have cabins, things like that. It was completely dead. So people really carried on life as normal in terms of they still went fishing, they still did this. And uh, a lot of my other friends, they just started doing other projects. Like uh, one friend started making wine out of Porajo because there was oh. no beer coming. There was no cargo boat with supplies and no one had the money to afford it. So all of these like little projects came up. Well, how can we, how can we, you know, drink well we'll make our own wine so I, I have to say i was not a big fan of the bottle hole wine at all um but my my french friend uh survived on it over the the pandemia so yeah I know, bottle hole wine i mean obviously like everything if you don't really like it it's an aphrodisiac um <laughs> that's a, there you go. kind of the rule behind it but let's let's hear a little bit about i mean your arrival in the pacific it was meant to be but it's not you know, I, I always think that, you know, we sitting up, setting up businesses in Montpellier, so, you know, that's out there, it's rural, but of course we have roads coming in and so on, and we can get things more or less easily. The Pacific Coast is even further. I mean, that's taking on a challenge. Perhaps you could share some of, I don't know, how were you accepted to begin with when you said, oh, I'm going to settle here? Yeah, the community is, is, um, it's so beautiful like i said it's a very small tight-knit community most people are related by you know in mm. some way or another um so it is quite a tight unit to integrate to people are always very outwardly mm -hmm. friendly but i did find it difficult to get more into that uh circle of trust and be seen as a resident rather than just mm -hmm. a passing tourist and initially with mm -hmm. prana pacifico because i was based in Moroterco a two kilometer mm -hmm. walk from the village it really was that i would come to buy things and leave or i would you know come with my group of tourists and parade them through the town and then leave and so it was very hard at that stage to really gain the full acceptance i think people were very curious about me because especially mm -hmm. moro terco um it had a lot of mysticism around it it was a private property that was never really open or available to um a lot of the local people and then for a single woman to come and take it on and live there um, and make it into like a, a, a moving profitable business, um, I, I feel that I gained a lot of respect for that, you know, like, uh, so that was a, a big way of kind of integrating into the community. And um, yeah, I think just with time and, and really for me, especially with the women, because I think it's always a bit harder with women, like obviously there was a natural curiosity for the men because it's fresh meat in a small town, you know, how it goes, but. <laughs> um the to actually gain the trust of the women and for them to accept me as a friend and not a threat um mm. that was tricky you know I, I i went there very laser focused on my business i definitely wasn't um interested in anything else but the the kitchen for me was where i really gained the trust and the respect of the women and where we shared mm. ideas and grew together as cooks and um mm. 
it was a, a wonderful moment, I think. And initially, again, they were very skeptical because, you know, the, the people, the women of the Pacific are revered for their gastronomia. And so they're kind of like, who's this white chick and who, who does she think she is, you know? So, mm. and obviously I had some more exotic ideas from my travels and things I've seen, you know, in different places around the world. So trying to implement this merriment of, okay, well, here are these local ingredient staples, if you will, you know, the banana, the coconut, fish, it's pretty much what you have to work with how what can we do with that to make it more interesting and how can we enhance the flavor and what can be we combine it with and how can we present it so initially i think they thought i was absolutely bonkers but then <laughs> poco a poco like trying my food and i started to get these slow little nods of appreciation like never like hey well done you're doing great but uh, just a little sly like you know discreet kudos um uh, and then like i said building relationships and working um shoulder to shoulder in the kitchen solving problems which always arise like the fishermen didn't catch fish what are we going to make for lunch like you know mm. so those types of uh situations really make you form a tribe i think and and mm. and earn respect and i always say you know when you're in the trenches with someone you you depend on them you you trust in them yeah. and that's what it was like there so it was a it was a long process um but you know, I'd just been out of the country for about six months and I came back and mm. I felt like a queen, you know, everybody was like, wow, welcome back. And the kids ran and greeted me. And, you know, so mm. I feel very much like um, I'm, a, I'm an appreciated part of the community now. After five years of mm -hmm. battling, yes, I've, I've finally been accepted, which has been wonderful. So, I mean, you got you, you wrote up your business plan and then Prana Pacifico was was born. Uh, this is what you're talking about with the cooking and learning traditional cooking and so on. What what does this prana pacifico mean? Yeah, so I mean, I I, I love the name actually, and it kind of came about. I mean, prana is very um, commercial, let's say everything's prana really, but um, what it means is vital energy, life force energy, and really that's what I felt there. Like even to the ongos that grow in your computer and in your sealed boxes. I mean, it is life, like everything, you know, the jungle is alive, there's abundance of water and growth and it's it's just incredible. So that for me was where the name came from and obviously it has its, uh, its ties to yoga and that was what the business was all about, was okay, let's create experiences for people and it wasn't your typical woo-woo kind of, you know, super serious, go on a mega diet for the weekend. No, it, it was really like, let's enjoy and connect and feel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that place was so perfect for it, you know, but especially in, in Moro Terco because it's exclusive. You're on this Moro, which is kind of like an island, um, 250 stairs to get up the top. So you really feel That's like perfect. you're in this kind of, you know, special cocoon. You're in this private place. So to host these retreats where people were, you know, eating conscious food and sitting together to, to, to eat, um, you know, active during the day, whether it was yoga classes or hikes in the jungle and swimming in the ocean. And really it was like, how can we bring people together and just raise the consciousness like, you know, about where the food is coming from and how is it prepared? And let's take a minute to enjoy eating it and be present and not have any phones. And obviously at that point we had no signal and uh, no Wi-Fi or anything like that. So that was a huge help. Um, but what I really observed is, again, the same as I said, is like going through the battles together. That's really outside people's comfort zone. To go on a small plane, a tiny boat, uh, climb 250 stairs, stay in a tree house on top of a hill. Like, you know, it, it's really uncomfortable for a lot of people, but to go through that with support and guidance and good company, um, and eat well, you know, it was just people left really happy and, you know, really transformed and with a, a different perspective of what, of what the Pacific was all about, which was kind of the idea. And what was your, I mean, what is your, uh, sort of, let's say, demographic, uh, Colombians to international visitors? Yeah, it was actually a really interesting mix. Um, it, I would say it was 50-50, to be honest. Like, there was a lot of expats living in Colombia. Um, some yeah. groups came completely from the exterior, like we had it registered on bookyogaretreats.com so people could join retreats um, from overseas. And also it depended who I made the alliance with because I wasn't responsible for the classes. My kind of business uh, model was that I was the hostess, the tour guide, um, actually the massage therapist and uh, the chef and created like the package of experience with local providers. Um, 
which was really wonderful as well because we got to all grow together. I mean, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, so it was really nice and mm. neither did they. So it was kind of growing collectively as well, which was really nice. And, and also funneling people into these local services, you know, they didn't have a phone, they don't have a web page, but you know, I had this power that I could, you know, privilege, if you will, to communicate to the external world and um, and bring people in. So I think that helped with the um, kind of the respect in the village as well, is that I wasn't just there taking, I was offering and supporting and giving opportunities to other people. And a lot of the time with the retreats, we had a spin off that we would either offer classes to the local community or as an offset, we would get like instruments. We did a music retreat, uh, Man in Bea, with a, a company mm. in Bogota who focus in Pacific music and things like that. And we did a retreat with them. So they came, uh, I think, three times in the end. Um, and with the profits, we invested in getting local instruments made in the traditional way by the elders that used to do it, who are like 70 now. Um, and unfortunately, the knowledge will die with them. But, you know, making these beautiful tambores with the hide of jungle ball that was hunted and brought to me bloody for me to stretch out on the floor where the people <laughs> do the yoga. I mean, you know, quite, quite the tale, but um, such a wonderful, like, you know, reciprocal relationship. And that was the, the big yeah. point of it as well. It's like, how can we create opportunity for other people? How can we support other local businesses to thrive and, and grow? Um, so yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a challenging time. It's probably the hardest job I've ever had in my life and definitely the lowest paying. <laughs> um, but it was, um, it was so formative for me as a person. Yeah. And, um, I, I really did learn so much and mostly about my but own capability. Hardest, yeah. Hardest job, lowest paying, most rewarding. Yeah. Uh, it often, yes. they often go together. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Especially when everything got pulled off, like just despite all of the the odds and all of the challenges. And I always use the analogy of like a duck on water, you know, the little duck looks so calm on the surface and underneath the little feet are going like crazy, you know. And that's pretty much was my whole time with Prana Pacifico. It was like this image, like everything's under control. And in the kitchen, we're like, oh my god what are we going to cook for these people in two hours because there's no fish or you know the the delivery of food didn't arrive from the boat so now what are we going to do so it was this constant um you know think on your toes invent create solution distract you know but it was uh it was wonderful and then of course when everybody leaves at the end of the weekend and they're happy and you collapse in an exhausted heap yes i felt extremely rewarded um during not always but um kind of like running you know you appreciate it afterwards yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah well i mean it sounds like a lot of the issues i have not so much with food um but in Montpos, it's always logistics it's always oh, yes. the logistics of transport in the caribbean i'm sure it affects you far more because of boats and so on the guy just decides not to wake up and i'm not working today i mean that's always you're know, like we've been working together for five years come on come on <laughs> so, yes but it's it's one of those, i want to know and i think my my listeners want to know more about the cooking experience about you learning and cooking alongside the local community tell us a little bit i mean because that's not easy that's not easy to penetrate you know to be with the women and to cook because that's a very i'd say it's a sacred place you know the kitchen yes. so give us give us a little bit of a background about that yeah well to be honest i never really intended to cook um my plan was to be do all the other things i mentioned and i had a friend who actually has a wonderful restaurant if anyone's in the coffee region called latinos um and he's a good friend of mine great chef and he was going to come out and cook and um in the end he got a great opportunity to go and do some i don't know i think he was got on television or something like that and so couldn't come so i was like oh wow i'm gonna have to do it now so he sent his assistant <laughs> to kind of just support me a little bit um and we just took it from there and designed a, a kind of a menu based on what we could find and bring easily. And um, I obviously had a lot of support from the local women. And like I said, in the beginning, I think it, because it's also, it's not a culturally and typically in the region, it's not about working necessarily side by side. It's more that I hire you and you do what I say. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden mm. now I'm very much more like, okay, well, what do you think? Like, how do you think we should do this? And actually it wasn't as well received as I anticipated 
I thought, you know, being a woman and being a little more collaborative in my approach, like I might gain a bit of like friendship and respect from that. But in the beginning, I think I was seen as like a bad manager because I wanted people's input and I empowered them to have a voice. And so even something as basic as that was a challenge, you know, because I came at it from this completely different perspective. And first of all, they're not used to having a lady boss. And second of all, they're not not used to having a nice lady boss that wants to actually work in a team. So that was the first kind of hurdle was, okay, how do I, you know, have respect as a manager, as a leader, but also work collaboratively and and like we all share ideas and everybody's empowered to make choices and and contribute. So that was the first um, issue. And then I think it was just about like fine tuning, like the women there are exceptional chefs and they have so much knowledge about the plants and their um, benefits and how that's kind of incorporated in in the cooking. So you're not, it's actually medicinal food, you know, it's it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it was just taking that and then fine tuning it with presentation, um, with Mm -hmm. stepping outside of like the normal ways of preparing the food and, you know, coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, so yeah, it was, like I said, it took some time to get to that point. And like I said, I think they thought I was absolutely bonkers and completely incompetent for the first, at least year. But then, like I said, people started trying the food and it came out good and people responded well to it. And then they were asking to take it home to their family. So that was when that shift really happened was like, oh, okay, it's different, but it's still cool. You know, like that was that kind of, um, yeah. So it was, it was a a really beautiful um experience and you know also i think what the women gained from it as well was this exposure to um a more intimate um, relationship with the guests you know like we would Mm -hmm. sit and eat together and there would be lots of interaction they would come join us for some yoga classes so i think it was that as well that really um was was the kind of value exchange you know it was like okay well you've got Mm -hmm. this base of like incredible ancestral knowledge about the region and about the products and then i came in here with a slightly different approach and ideas and and it it all came together really well in the end i think phenomenal some some weeks ago we had a I, would, I want to call her food academic, a Colombian food academic on the show called, uh, her name's cool. Juliana Duque. And she does write-ups for hotels and other things. She's on a podcast, uh, the New Welder podcast, which is very good uh, about food and so on. And uh, her, the, I, I entitled the podcast episode, is Colombian food isn't bland, it's subtle. Uh, and how would you, as someone uh, very much involved in that, respond to that kind of uh, that that well, that kind of description? To be honest, this is a conversation I've had with a lot of friends. Is on. based on the wonderful produce uh, available in the country. Um, I have always felt a little disappointed with There's the no gastronomic. There's no, no sound. sound. The sound's oh. gone. I didn't touch anything. Well, it's not me. I've got 100%. Uh, stop. Mm, can you hear me now? No. Hello? Okay, let's Hello? go through that way then. Can you hear me? Okay, okay, let's keep going then, and I'll edit it. <laughs> Don't know what happened. Great. All right, so sorry. If we could go back and just say, what, what, how do you respond to a description about a Colombian food in that way? Listen, I've, I've had this discussion with a lot of my friends, and I, I do believe that for the amazing offering of fresh produce that Colombia has, the gast- Gastronomy is a little disappointing. I feel that it could be definitely developed and explored and exploited a lot more than it is. I think the Pacific is definitely the exception because they have such interests to work with. And uh, like I said, the coconut and the fact that the coconut becomes the base for a lot of the sauces Mm -hmm. and soups and things like that. Um, Amazing fresh seafood, um, the patacon. You know, it's it's got this very... um, 
defined signature taste and flavor that people seek you know like mm -hmm. so that for me is the exception but honestly i i do find it quite i i often find that uh, in colombia if you go to a slightly fancier place it's almost kind of over the top in its effort to be fancy it's too many things all at once and it's actually you lose it it's too many stars in the show so like a telenovela mm -hmm. too much drama you know i i prefer something and and i think that's probably the key to my cooking because i'm not really a fancy chef you know i've never mm -hmm. professionally studied um gastronomy or cooking it's something that i've just developed very intuitively because i love to eat more mostly um and i would say that my my cooking is very simple and very subtle and it plays on how do i enhance the natural flavor of this dish and all these products and so that's mm. kind of what i've played with um and obviously you know different textures and colors because i do think that um presentation is so important and, and i'm not an artist at all i'm not you know drawing painting is not my thing but when i play a dish like i mm. really enjoy the the intricacy mm -hmm. of making a, a pretty picture you know so um yeah that that would be my comment i i also do like quite a bit of like i like strong flavors like ginger and cilantro and and spice very kind of southeast asian inspired flavors and obviously you don't get a lot of that here so that always i'm always adding things you know i'm like do you have ahi can i have some black pepper just to give it a little kick yeah but they've got good ahi on the Pacific coast. They've got yes. good ahi. Yeah, yeah. they've got good spicy sauce. I like it. I like it. Oh, though. yeah. Uh, and that's the rest of the nice country is a bit it, mild. Yes. Yeah. No, <laughs> they, and uh, we actually just on the way back uh, yesterday from the coast, uh, obviously had the the ob obligatory empanada as you leave mm. at eight in the morning. Fish empanada with this beautiful, like, coconut spicy sauce. Wow. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. Mm. Yeah. That's very good. So tell me and tell us about the book. The book. The book, yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's actually so wonderful for it to finally come to fruition because it's been a very long-term project. And if anybody's had any experience with like writing or, or anything like that, they, I'm sure they can relate. Um, and there's definitely been lots of phases of inspiration and complete, um, you know, abandonment of the project. So it's, it's definitely been a, a roller coaster. But um, the idea started, um, I always had a photographer um, making highlights videos and getting promotional content for the retreats. And often on the during the retreats, people would say, wow, I want the recipe. And I would just like scribble it on a post-it note, you know, that was probably gonna get soggy <laughs> and shoved in a bag somewhere. Um, but the lady that was um, helping me with these retreats, Manuela Eres, who is the principal photographer for the book, and a very talented photographer um, said to me, Amiga, why don't we start taking pictures of your food and we can make a recipe book? And I hadn't even dawned on me, to be honest. I was so busy being the tour guide, the massage therapist, the cook and everything else <laughs> that it hadn't even really dawned on me. So it was quite an organic process. And every retreat, she would take her camera out and we'd record a bit of the production of the things and, you know, take a bit of effort to make something look pretty and get the right light and take the picture which again is a lot more of a production than I ever imagined. You know, there's a lot more to mm -hmm. it. And my mad respect to her because the images that she took are just spectacular. Um, and it is really hard food photography, actually, like to, to really get the dimension and the depth and for it not just to look like a blob on a plate is, um, is, is not easy. So she did a really, really good job. And so we did that actually first. And it was mostly then poco a poco, like in the pandemia and whenever I had mm -hmm. spare moments that I would sit and, actually had to quantify all of my recipes because they were all completely empirical, intuitive, like a little dash of this and a shake of that and just feeling, you know? So then I actually had to sat, sit down and go, well, how much is a shake actually? And how much is a, a little pinch and, and quantify all of my recipes? Um, and once I had all of that, then it was okay, well, what, what story do I want to tell? And how do I link mm. this all in to make it a bit more human and personable and share kind of the background story a little bit behind the, the food and the recipes. Um, so yeah, that's how it all really began. And I have to say the process was actually extremely therapeutic for me um, because I was forced to sit and review 
um, all of my old photographs and mm -hmm. uh, revisit all of these funny stories um, in the process of going out fishing for the first time or trying to open a coconut for the first time or <laughs> learning about all the medicinal plants that I could use also in the kitchen to give flavor to the food. And um, so it was actually a wonderful therapeutic, cathartic experience. And mm -hmm. now that I'm on the other side again, I, I feel alleviated. I feel like I've kind of released uh, some of these, I don't know, feeling stories, experiences uh, that I've been carrying, you know, for the last five years and, and mm -hmm. hopefully sharing it in a medium that's inspiring and uh, mm -hmm. helps promote the Pacific and share the wonderful, magical place that it is and help create, again, more opportunities for the people that live there. So that's kind of the, the intention, let's say, behind actually uh, getting this book out there. So it's called Prana Pacifico, A Taste of Paradise? It's actually just called A, a Taste of Paradise. And it's uh, recipes okay. and reflections from living off grid on the Colombian Pacific coast. Because that's oh, the whole I... other element as well, yeah. I think, is that it's mostly about, I think what, what it was for me is the consolidation between the original pipe dream or image I had about starting this life in this magical, exotic place Mm. and then the actual reality of it you know because yeah. obviously i was like great i'm just gonna go live in choco and everything will be fine and like i said i i didn't even really think twice. i i deliberate more on what to eat for dinner than i did mm. in move there you know i mean mm. really i i if i thought about it properly i probably wouldn't have done it which is you know blessing and a curse in the same time but um <laughs> i think for me like i said the real i kind of had this image that i would go there and and live this kind of idyllic hippie lifestyle where I would grow all my own food and harvest <laughs> it and just cook only with that. And um, in the reality, you know, it's, it's really tough, actually. It's a full-time job to maintain a garden, especially when you're fighting against aguaceros and the, you know, leaf eater ants and the parrots and also, you know, so many factors. And um, so that was a huge wake up call. And I think also just about, yeah, like there's no rappy, you know, when there's no mm -hmm. fish, there's no fish. You can't go to another supermarket and find it. So it's just the the assimilation, I think, of what I imagined it to be and then the actual reality of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now, to be perfectly frank, I love the Pacific, but I don't necessarily see it as somewhere I want to live full time. The humidity is a factor and um so yeah. many other things i think also it is just so remote and the logistics as you yeah. said is an absolute nightmare but it's still and always will be such a magical place for me mm -hmm. and i also have my house there now so that's my other kind of project um that's coming to completion hopefully just in time for the whale season um yeah, yeah. but it's uh my own house casa prana um so after my, my contract ended with moro terco the people that i rented the property from um I bought my own piece of land and then, yeah, the real adventure began and I started to build, um, design and build my own house. And I was very involved with the process in terms of going to the jungle and carrying on my shoulder big planks of wood down this muddy track, you know, and, and, and bringing it to my land and um, obviously from the designing and, and bits and bobs and things like that. So I'm so happy now to have this beautiful space that I've created so that I can share that with people too, the people mm. that want to go to the Pacific, but maybe just want a little bit of support and getting there and want a comfortable mm. place to be when they get there. Well, I've done all the hard work for you and it's all ready to go. So hopefully from, from August on, um, if anybody is interested in going to the Pacific, then feel free to reach out and you can go Airbnb, my beautiful jungle chic home. I think we'll be there, but have you ever read a pull through the Mosquito Coast? No. Oh, you would you'd relate to it. I mean, it's it's dated, of course. It's uh, eighty from the eighties, I believe. But of course, he takes his family off grid in what is the Mosquito Coast of uh, Nicaragua, of Nicaragua. Mm. But it's it's all about that the hard work uh, of of setting up. And I, you know, there's other different different angles on the story, but I think you'd relate to it very much. So uh, you know, carrying like flanks. <laughs> yes. Um, when and where can we get the book? Okay, so the book will be available on Amazon on the 19th mm -hmm. of March, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Um, so mm -hmm. you can order your hard copy or a digital copy for your Kindle. 
Um, mm. At the moment, we only have it online um, in English, but I'm currently printing in Spanish as well. And so via my website, people can order in Spanish if they if they so wish. What's your website? Um, that's a great question. Can we put it in the notes? I think it's just literally www.lindsayrankin.com, but let me just okay. double check I'll that. put it in the notes. I'll put it in the notes. It'll all be there. Don't worry. Uh, Lindsay. Wonderful. I'm been... pretty sure it's just my name.com, but just in case it isn't, or there's a sneaky little point there, <laughs> then. <laughs> Have you got, the, the fungus has not just affected your computer. <laughs> it's got in there Lindsay you've been affected by the Pacific Coast and that's wonderful um, yeah. it's really great and I really enjoy conversations of this type that are so upbeat and so well I don't want to say positive and you appear to be in a position right now that is so um, I would say enviable you seem very happy and, you know, with this idea of what's going on, of course, you've said you don't want to live full time on the Pacific coast, but the Pacific has taken part of you uh, oh, and 100%. you will be there. hundred <laughs> yeah. yeah. percent. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's almost become part of my identity, you know, like it mm -hmm. really has. I carry that knowledge with me and uh, those experiences with me. And, and like I said, it's, just living in a close knit community like that. I think we've really lost touch with that now, especially all in apartments, closed doors, you know, everything's private and, you know, it's almost hard to go knock for a, for a cup mm. of sugar or something nowadays. Um, whereas there, especially in the hard times, there's mm. always that, you know, how they have the Colombian expression, Pueblo Pequeño, Invierno Grande or Invierno oh, Grande. Yeah. yeah. But actually, even with all the discussions and problems and quejas, when it really counts, if someone gets sick and they need to get to Nuki or to Medellin, everybody's there for you, even the people that you had yep. the discussion with the other day. And so that's something that I've really carried with me as well as a sense of community and helping each other out and yeah, collaborating, you know, like working as yeah. a team, as a collective to get goals. I mean, even basic things like getting a medical person out to do a brigada or the vets mm. out to do it a sterilization. It's such a huge effort but together we kind of make it because you have to advocate yourself because no one else will you know so you're yeah. in this very remote isolated community you can't depend on the state you can't depend mm. on you know there's no hospital um there's not even really any lay out there so you you mm. the community takes on a, a whole other role in your life you know it's not just like mm. these people that are around it's like my, they're my family and if i can help mm. them i will and and they've very much been the same with me so I definitely feel like I, I have a home there and a family there. And even if I'm not deciding to kind of live there full time, and maybe it's just because of my age, I still feel that I want to travel and explore mm -hmm. and have new experiences. And actually I'm relocating to Chile um, in the middle of the okay. year um, <laughs> to open a restaurant on the Pacific coast there. So I, you can definitely say there's at least a theme. I'm just <laughs> in love with the Pacific coast, wherever it may be. Okay. And this is a, a very different Pacific coast. It's cold and windy and wild in its own ways. Um, but I'm so ready to just launch into that hot fry pan again and survive and create and, and you know, see what happens and learn and grow and, and share. So um, mm -hmm. if anyone's traveling to Chile, Pichilemo, look <laughs> me up, I'll be there. <laughs> I think what I like most, I, I'm enjoying everything here, Lindsay, but what I, I'm enjoying the most is the Spanglish coming through. And, oh my gosh, uh, I'm terrible for uh, it. When, when you, you talked about the, if you, the person you had the discussion with, it, it, well, of course, that's the Spanglish because the discussion is an argument in Spanish, but yes. it's discussion in English. I love it. I, I, I talked about an inversion, an inversion the other day, an investment. And so, yes. you know, it's, it, it happens it's to the best of us. I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I mean. I talked to my mum, and uh, actually, she came to visit me in uh, about 2015. So she made the trek out, and there were so many funny things that she picked up, like the 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 lip thing, you know, when you've got your hands full mm. and you, you know. So she was like, "What on lips. earth is going on <laughs> with your face? Like, are you okay?" And I'm like, "Yeah." But so I, I often speak to my mum, and all this Spanglish comes out, and I think she's actually slowly learning Span Spanish from my, you know. Uh, my influence of just <laughs> slotting in those Spanish words into our everyday conversation. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, Lindsay, I, let me take this moment to say thank you so much 
for your time and your generosity in sharing the experience. I feel like I've, I've almost already visited you out there. Well, I will, but it's, it's really been special to, to listen to this. And I wish you all the best, not only with the, your home, but also with the book. And then, of course, the restaurant in Chile. I mean, is there any, is there any end to your skills and capabilities? We'll soon find out. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, uh, well, we'll close this off now. Check out check out the book. Of course, we'll be putting it all up on the show notes and social media, Taste of Paradise. Uh, look up Lindsay uh, Rankin. Of course, uh, we'll have her website up as well. This has been episode 511 of the Columbia Calling podcast. We'll be back next week with further interviews of people talking about Columbia or Columbia as a lens for a conversation. This has been a really fun, upbeat uh, episode, and I know you'll all have enjoyed it. So, of course, subscribe or support us on patreon.com forward slash Columbia Calling, and we'll be back next week again. Thank you and goodbye.